From the 14th to the 17th century, siege warfare became ever more important in Central Europe. Engineers and tacticians developed fortresses that were more elaborate and more solid than ever before. As a result, siege warfare reached an immense level of complexity. Throughout the Middle Ages, high and relatively thin walls were enough to protect against storming ladders, siege equipment and projectiles. But since the 14th century, ever more effective firearms and artillery challenged the defensive potential of fortresses. A to and throw of military innovation began. Improved fortifications countered improved gunpowder weapons and vice versa. This went on until the end of the 16th century, when according to Stefan Hoppe, quote, a successful solution to all important issues of defense had been found, end quote. One famous type of stronghold that was crucial to this evolution was the Tras Italien, better known as Star Fortress. It was to be found quickly all over Europe, though in a variety of forms. Historian John A. Lynn states that at the same time the numbers of fortified sites increased drastically, so that Central European warfare shifted away from open field battles and finally revolved above all around sieges. During this time period, sieges differed greatly from case to case, just as the besieged cities themselves differed. The complexity of this subject necessitates simplification. This requires us to apply a technique that historians use frequently. This technique is known as ideal type and it is based on the works of the great German sociologist Max Weber. This is to say, we will not look at every individual siege. Instead, we take reoccurring elements from different sieges to construct a typical and ideal siege that we then use to explain the most important and most common tactics of siege warfare. Modern-day historiography explains the complex nature of siege warfare as follows. The backbone of the defense on polygonal fortresses were the bastions. A bastion had two faces that could accommodate several pieces of artillery, with which approaching enemies could be shot at from a great distance. The shoulders were built, as depicted here, to fire at the shoulder of the next bastion, or along the piece of wall in between two bastions, known as the curtain. This was to make sure there were no blind spots in the defense. Yet the most essential strength of a fortress were the relatively low and thick walls. They were supported with earth that could withstand heavy artillery fire for a long time, a quality direly needed in the early modern period. A ditch, sometimes filled with water, prevented attackers from attempting to take the stronghold by storm. Ravelines, V-shaped outworks, protected the curtains from direct fire. It was only after around 1600 that sometimes further outworks were added. At the bottom of the wall, there was a berm, a small alleyway. The covered way was a path which continued along the outer edges of the ditch and provided an advanced defensive position. It was covered by the glassy, a parapet of a man's height, which on one hand covered the man fighting on the covered way from enemy fire, but on the other hand, and much more importantly, matched in angle with the top of the wall so that an attacker could only fire at the wall from far away, which was much less effective. Therefore, the enemy was forced to take the glasses before he could attempt to breach the walls. Attacking such a fortress was very expensive. It required a lot of manpower and an enormous amount of time. The siege of Candia, to name but one extreme example, lasted from 1648 to 1669, that is, 21 years. According to historian John A. Lin, a determined siege almost always resulted in the fall of the fortress. But the strategical value of a fortress was not that it was invulnerable, its value was in the high price the enemy had to pay in money, manpower and time to capture it. Because of this, rather creative and sometimes unconventional ways to get hold of a fortress were preferred. The most simple method was just to threaten a siege or direct attack. In many cases, the mere sight of an army alongside a guarantee of safe conduct was enough to get the defender to surrender. If it did not, 
a stratagem of war was always a good alternative. Let's look at an illustrating example. The French city of Amiens was conquered by the Spanish using a stratagem of war in 1597. The Spanish approached the city under the cover of night and blocked all roads to and from the city with detachments of infantry. Then 500 infantrymen hid in houses, thickets and barns in front of the city. In the morning, the citizens and farmers strolled into the city oblivious of the danger that was to come. 30 Spanish men disguised themselves as women and farmers, hiding their weapons under their clothes and pretending to take their goods to the market. They entered the city with carts loaded with nuts for the market. As they passed the city gates, they threw one of the carts over, which spread the stored nuts all over the ground. Chaos ensued. People were swearing at the clumsy farmers while stealing the nuts. Taking advantage of the confusion, the intruders dropped their disguise, killed some residents and neutralized the guards at the gate. Then they opened the gate in order to let in the man hiding in front of the city, as well as four additional companies of cavalry. In less than half an hour, they had taken over the city. The French then laid siege on the city to recapture it. If such a stratagem of war didn't succeed, army leaders took to much more violent alternatives. These ranged from cutting off the fortress from supply lines and starving out the inhabitants, to storming the walls with ladders. However, the option that interests us here is the formal siege. When an army wanted to lay siege on a fortress, it first established various quarters beyond the reach of the defense's artillery. The soldiers dug out entrenchments around these camps to secure them before the first offensive measures were taken. Then a contra and circumvallation was dug. That is, two lines of trenches which connected the various camps of the siege army around the city. Olaf van Nimwegen, an expert on Dutch warfare, states that this made it almost impossible to relieve a beleaguered city, because the inner ring, the circumvallation, made sorties beyond this point virtually impossible. While the outer ring, the contravallation, protected the sieging army from attacks from the outside. This is reminiscent of Caesar's famous siege of Alesia in 52 BC, where he had the rear of his army also fortified with an additional wall. Van Imwegen's statement is supported, for example, by Maurice of Nassau's siege on the Spanish forces in the city of Gertrudenberg in 1593. Maurice even ordered the circumvallation to be continued on the sea by ships, so that the city was cut off completely. After about a month, a Spanish force tried to relieve the besieged, but it was repelled by the entrenched besiegers and weakened by an enemy foray. Starting at the circumvallation trenches, so-called approaches were dug towards the walls. To protect them against sorties, small redoubts were constructed, in which small detachments were placed. Often, the approaches were dug from multiple sites at the same time, so that defenders remained in the dark where the main attack would come from. In the case of the Dutch army under Maurice and his half-brother Frederick Henrik, each side was dug out by men of the same origin, which turned the digging into a contest of nations. The English who fought in the Dutch army competed with their Dutch and German comrades to get to the walls the fastest. Once the approaches were within firing distance of the first defensive position, the men began to sap. Saps were shoveled out zigzag ways, so that the guns of the fortress could not shoot along them. Additionally, up to three parallel trenches were dug out in regular intervals. They functioned as strongholds and provided cover for the troops and platforms for artillery. According to Georg Ortenburg, one major problem with all this earthwork was that the soldiers didn't like digging it at all. If the soldiers did the job themselves, they demanded an additional fee. But most of the time, this laborious and dangerous work had to be contracted out. Because of the high risk involved in the task, the contractors charged a lot. Sieges, therefore, required to have a substantial amount of money in reserve. While the attackers slowly came closer to the walls of the fortress, the defenders certainly didn't remain idle. 
They shot at the sappers and tried to disturb or destroy the constructions of the besiegers in sorties. Corresponding to this, the main task of the artillery of the offenders during the first phase of the siege was to silence the guns of the defenders. However, the cannonade often aimed at the town itself, in the hope of stirring up an uprising against the garrison. The inhabitants tried to protect themselves and their homes against such cannonades. They reinforced their roofs with layers of earth and were ready to put out potential fires at all times. One example for a successful deployment of this strategy was the Siege of Venlo in 1637. On the 24th of September, the besieging Spanish managed to set the town ablaze, whereupon the inhabitants, according to a letter of Frederick Henrik, quote, sought to take control of the person of the governor, of the arsenal and lastly of the gateway, end quote. They forced the governor to negotiate with the besiegers and Venlo capitulated the next day. This also shows the importance of artillery in such sieges. The historian Georg Ortenburg notes, quote, Artillery was widely considered the most important means of attack. End quote. The most frequently used siege cannons were full and demi cannons. However, not too many of these heavy guns were deployed at the same time, since they were very unwieldy. A complete 24 pounder, for example, required no fewer than 17 draught horses to be moved and used a tremendous amount of powder. Van Imwegen states, the recoil of such heavy cannons was so powerful that it would roll back five to six meters after each round. In addition to these giant but very slow pieces with a low frequency of fire, Smaller guns of various kinds, such as culverines and breech-loading chamber pieces and early mortar pieces were deployed. Olaf van Imwegen mentions that during the siege of Ostend from 1601 to 1604, the defenders shot their way through an average of 2,000 pounds of powder each day, thereby releasing 300 balls. Artillery pieces were usually grouped in batteries, which were more effective when placed on elevated earthworks. In a trench, in front of each battery, an infantry detachment covered the guns against an enemy sortie. Before the addition of ravelines in the second half of the 16th century, the middle of the curtain wall was the target. The main battery, tasked to dismantle the wall defenses, was placed in a distance matching its reach, i.e. 450 to 600 meters. Its main objective was to destroy the enemy artillery and parapet. It was the center of the whole operation and was reinforced by wings on each side, which targeted the neighboring bastions. While the cannons thundered over their heads, the men in the trenches had to be on guard, not to be overrun by a sortie of the defenders. A sortie could be done in various ways, and its main goal was to weaken the position of the besiegers, for example by destroying their earthwork and artillery. Often the besieged tried to catch their enemies off guard, they try to take them out with a quick cavalry charge or invade the trenches armed with swords, daggers and other weapons suited for such confined spaces. These weapons were even more of an advantage in rainy weather, when the musketeers of the enemy who couldn't light their gunpowder were defenseless. The success of a sortie depended on two things. Firstly, on the element of surprise and secondly, on the number of men deployed. Small garrisons had no chance to undertake effective actions against the besieger, because all men were needed on the walls. Let's look again at the siege of Amiens in 1597. During the French re-sieging, the beleaguered Spanish made several sorties. On the 22nd of May, 500 Spanish cavalrymen left the fortress and headed for the main camp of the French. They managed to get as far as the earthwork protecting the camp. They took hold of the earthwork and were stopped only then by the French. After a fight of two hours, the French finally drove the Spanish horsemen back and pursued them. By the skin of their teeth, the Spanish just managed to close the gates before the pursuing French could enter the city. It took 400 Spanish infantrymen who rushed to the gates at the last possible moment to keep the French out. The final phase of a siege began when the attackers gained control of the covered way. While the artillery tried to reduce the defenders' foothold on the bulwark, engineers started to build a bridge or dam across the ditch. A breaching battery was placed immediately at the glacis, 
or as close to the wall as possible. It began to shoot a breach in the curtain wall or in the face of a bastion. This was done by aiming at a point above the lower third of the wall. The next shots would then be shot slightly to the left or the right. This was usually repeated over an extended period of time. This breach had to be big enough to let the man storm through it. If it was too narrow, the miners and sappers were called in. These specialists dug tunnels beneath the defensive works and the wall itself, and then set the supporting pillars ablaze to cause the tunnel and the fortifications above it to collapse. In many cases, powder kegs were placed under the target, sealed and lit. To counter these hidden attacks, the defenders dug tunnels as well. When they detected enemy miners, there were several ways to prevent them from accomplishing their work. For example, by invading their tunnels and taking them out in melee, or by blowing up the mine prematurely. When the attackers managed to breach the wall of the fort, the last line of defense had fallen. In most cases, however, the defenders surrendered before the storm of the fortress began. Holding on to resistance for too long could be a fatal error. In those cases, the defeated had to endure plundering and punishment rather than be granted safe conduct. <laughs>